Please welcome John Mandyke, Chief Sustainability Officer, United Technologies Corporation. Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to Greenbuild. We're so thrilled to kick off Greenbuild with the International Summit and all of you here today. This is the seventh International Summit presented uh, by Carrier, a division of United Technologies, and really proud to be associated with this great event and all of you since the very beginning of the International Summit. This morning, we're gonna make a really exciting announcement with Harvard University, but first I wanna provide some context for the announcement that we're about to make. Buildings, as you all know, consume 40% of the world's energy, 40%. So the future of sustainability and the future of buildings clearly go hand in hand. And we know more than anybody else in this room that green buildings are the major solution for our lower carbon future. And we've made tremendous progress. Everybody in this room collectively, we've made tre tremendous progress and there's much to celebrate for our collective contribution advancing the green building movement globally. But I have to tell you, while we celebrate, we have to accelerate. Now more than ever is the time to accelerate the green building movement around the world. And it's clear to me that the accelerator for green buildings is health and productivity. Health and productivity is the accelerator for green buildings. And that's why we partnered with Harvard University four years ago to design and present cutting edge research that we were proud to sponsor that is changing the conversation in the real estate industry. Take a look. The world's population is expected to grow by 35% in the next 35 years, topping 9 billion by 2050, with nearly 70% of that population living in urban centers. As green buildings emerge as the solution to sustainable urbanization, attention is shifted to one big and critically important question. What is the true impact of green buildings on people? The COG effect studies are revealing the answers. Performed by the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health's Center for Health and the Global Environment, SUNY Upstate Medical University, and Syracuse University, COG effect studies examine the impact of green buildings on occupants' cognitive function. Study one found a doubling of cognitive function test scores in simulated green building environments with better ventilation, lower carbon dioxide levels, and fewer volatile organic compounds. It also quantified the significant monetary impact of improvements in decision-making and the resulting gains in productivity. In study two, the team moved from the lab to the real world, conducting research in 10 office buildings across the United States. This time, researchers turned their attention to the concept of building omics, examining the holistic impact of buildings on overall health and well-being. The study showed that occupants of high-performing green certified buildings had 26% higher cognitive function scores, slept better, and reported fewer health symptoms. The results of the first two studies are already changing the green building discussion. Now, study three is going global. Primary support for the study came from United Technologies and its UTC Climate Controls and Security business. So today is the next major step. Today we're announcing study three, the COGFX Global Building Study. As you heard, study one was in the lab with 24 people. Study two is in 10 US office buildings with 109 people. And now study three is gonna be truly amazing. 100 buildings across the world reaching 1,000 people over the next three years. Health and productivity is the accelerator for the green building movement, and this research will provide the data that we need to move the, the movement forward, because I'm convinced that data drives decisions, and it's this very data that we can use to accelerate the movement. So joining me on stage are the early supporters that are gonna make this research possible. First, I wanna thank and welcome JLL, represented by Bob Best and Jenna Rowe, for all that they're doing to join us in helping to sponsor the research, so thank you, Bob and Jenna. I wanna welcome four green building councils for signing on early to support the study. The World GBC and the Singapore GBC, uh, represented by Tai Lee Tsang. Tai Lee, thank you for all that you're doing. The Australia GBC, represented by Jorge Chapa. Jorge, thanks for joining us today. The Brazil GBC, represented by Felipe Faria. Felipe, thank you. The US GBC, represented by Peter Templeton. Thank you, Peter. 
and my colleagues at United Technologies, Mary Milmo and Corey Ricalde, and of course our experts from Harvard, the scientists who are actually doing the hard work, Dr. Joe Allen and Dr. Piers McNaughton. So we're gonna take a quick picture to celebrate this. Thank you, everybody. So to brief you on the mechanics of how this study will work, I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Joe Allen from Harvard University. Joe is an assistant professor at the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard, and he's also the director of the Healthy Buildings Program at the Harvard Center for Health and the Global Environment, which is where I've been working with Joe over the last four years on this research. So please welcome Joe Allen. Thanks, John. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share um, the highlights of what we're going to uh, be launching just this year. But first, I want to start with a question. How do you know what you know about healthy living? How do you know that exercise is good for you? You maybe have seen guidance from the CDC saying you should exercise for 150 minutes a week. Maybe your Fitbit buzzes when you take 10,000 steps. What is the basis for that? Maybe you've heard that sitting is the new smoking. So how do you know that exercise is good for you? How do you know that a diet low in saturated fats is good for heart health? How do you know that a healthy lunch is a handful of nuts? Maybe you've heard of the Mediterranean diet and how it's associated with lower risk of stroke. What is the basis for that kind of information? What about air pollution? How do you know what you know about air pollution? We all know it's bad for us. Maybe you've seen reports that air pollution kills 3 million people globally every year. You've probably even heard of things like PM 2.5. Well, what is that and why do we know it's bad for us? Well, I'll argue that much of what we know about healthy living comes from these great human epidemiological cohort studies that follow people over time. Studies like the Framingham Heart Study, the Nurses Health Study, the famous Harvard Six City Study, which set the basis for the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. But if you look at all of these findings from these epi studies, you'll see something missing. Never do they talk about the role of the building. And we plan to change that. And what we're announcing today is really the first of its kind global longitudinal cohort study of buildings and people in buildings that build on the methodology from that COGFX work. So in study one, as John said, we were in the lab. Then we moved to real buildings in the US. Well, now it's time to look at buildings across the world using that same methodology and the same tools to get at these fundamental questions of what are the drivers of better health and productivity in green buildings. And here's how we're gonna do it. It's a three-year study. We're recruiting buildings uh, from every region of the world, 10 participants in each building, and we're asking you to join us and be a participant in this work. And here's how it's gonna go. So we have the same team that worked on the, the COG effect study of one and two, that will now be uh, working on the third uh, installation of this work. So it's myself, Dr. Piers McNaughton, Dr. Usha Satish at SUNY Upstate Medical Center, and Dr. Jack Spangler at Harvard. And then we've expanded the team, and the, many of them are right over there at that table in the front, with new expertise in data science, building science, and sensor technologies. We have our key partner in United Technologies for the past four years, provided the support to even launch the study. We have new partners with JLL that are uh, gonna help us get access to the first set of buildings in Asia. We have key partners with the US GBC, World GBC, Australia GBC, Singapore GBC, Brazil GBC, and that's just to start. This is what it looks like for a participant who's in our study. They're gonna receive a package. Uh, and inside that package are a couple things. The first thing is a sensor kit. So here they'll have a sensor they can put on their wall or on their desk, and it measures these key in indoor environmental quality uh, factors that determine ultimately or indicators of uh, better building performance. They'll also have a Fitbit type watch that tracks things like physical activity and sleep. And then last, the whole study will be administered through a new app we've created. And this app is the 4Health app. My Healthy Buildings program is at 4Health.org. And the app is going to integrate 
uh, all of the data for the study. And it's how we're going to do things like informed consent. It's where the, environmental, the participant can look at the environmental performance of their space. It's the mechanism by which we will test cognitive function using the methodology from the first cog effect studies. And the key innovation here is that the app integrates data from the environmental sensor and the wearable so that we can ask questions at particular time and places. So we only want to ask questions when people are in their office. Well, we can understand that based on the technology in their cell phone. We also maybe want to ping them with certain questions when the ventilation is too low, say when carbon dioxide reaches over 1,000 parts per million. And this is what we're able to do with this technology our team has developed over the past several years, and now we're rolling it out in a global building study. So our big picture goal here is to understand to the level of detail, similar to those great human epidemiological cohort studies, how buildings influence us across all nine foundations of a healthy building. And we can start to look at how individuals perform against themselves over time, how colleagues compare in the same building, how buildings in the same city compare against each other, and then importantly, how buildings in different regions of the world compare against each other. So our mission at the Healthy Buildings Program uh, is the help of all people in all buildings everywhere, every day. We can only get to that point with studies like this. We can only get there with great partners like UTC, JLL, and the GBCs, and really with you and people uh, who are at this conference, because we want you to be a part of this study. So I encourage you to reach out to me. Uh, I'll be here all week. All members of my team are here all week. You can go to these websites to learn more about how you can get involved in what I know will be the foundation for what we know about how, health, how buildings drive health well-being and productivity going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. And we look forward to all of your support in the room for the Global COG FX Study 3. And as Joe mentioned, if you'd like to participate, there's lots of ways that you can do it, and we thank you for your support. I now have the great pleasure to introduce my friend, uh, Scott Horst. Uh, and last year, Scott, you might remember at this international summit, presented ARC. He unveiled ARC, the digital platform that is the first of its kind to help buildings, communities, and cities benchmark and track sustainability performance using a performance score. As the CEO of ARC Score Root, he's been overseeing the digital platform's growth which now includes more than 2,000 projects worldwide. There are few people who can speak better to the transformative power of LEED than Scott. In his previous role as the Chief Product Officer at the U.S. Green Building Council, he oversaw the development of LEED as the single global system allowing projects to benchmark themselves and spearhead performance of LEED, which eventually evolved into the performance of ARC. We'll hear from him about the transformative power of data and technology and what's on the horizon as we all look to work and create a higher performance workplace structures and spaces. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Scott Horst to the stage. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you. To Carrier, John and Carrier, for all of your years of sustained um, uh, sponsorship of this conference, and it's so wonderful to see all of you here again. Um, this is one of my favorite events because we have people from so many different countries in the room that are part of the same thing that we're trying to do. Um, in the late 90s, the band De La Soul uh, created their fourth album, and the album is called Stakes is High. When they introduce the title track, they have a homeless man speaking, and he's talking about what it's like to be on the street. And he basically says, you know, sometimes it's not so bad. You know, sometimes it's not like people hurt me or anything, but sometimes, you know, I, I go and I get really hungry and then I start getting really depressed, and it goes round and round, and..." I just don't know how it's going to work, and I don't know what's going to happen. And he says, stakes is high. And then they go into the song. See, when things are down, the stakes are higher. When things are down, the stakes are higher. That's relevant for us today because All In, the title of this conference, 
is an American colloquialism. Actually, if you look in the dictionary, it doesn't exist. It only exists in urban dictionaries. And the term all in comes from poker. When you put all of your cards down, when the stakes are high, you put all your cards down, you're all in. Now for us, that's important because, see, for us right now, stakes are really high. The, the largest emitting nation in the world pulled out of the greatest, the first global carbon pact. Stakes are high. Our, our own Environmental Protection Agency is doing the opposite of what it's done in the past. Stakes are high. We've got a lot of work to do. We're going in the opposite direction. I heard John say, buildings account for 40% of carbon emissions. We've been given that number for 20 years. It should at least be 39.5. Stakes are high. It should, I don't ever want to come to another, another conference and hear 40. I want to hear 39, 38, 37, 36. The stakes are high for us. We have a lot to prove. For us with ARC, we're trying to move into a different way of thinking about leadership and how to put our own cards down. For us, we're saying, Stakes are high, all buildings in, all buildings. We want all buildings to have a score of zero to 100 to understand how they fit relative to each other. And in order to do that, we have to standardize. Do you all remember what it was like to drive across the country with your cell phones or drive anywhere with your cell phones when you had to go into different um, roaming, uh, roaming areas? Because cell phone companies finally standardize how they do that, we can travel from one place to the other without having to do all that work ourselves. Standardization makes our life very simple. We know what it's like to go places where we have to carry adapters in order to simply plug in our devices. What we're doing is standardizing and providing feedback. We're, we, aren't, we don't want to tell you how to do anything. We have lead for that, we have many fantastic systems, we have great ideas. We simply want to tell you if your high performance green building is indeed a high performance green building. We want to give you feedback on exactly where you are relative to, to each other and in order to do that we have to standardize the systems of measurement. And in order to do that we have to think very differently about what leadership means. See when we created lead, it was a really cool idea. It is a really cool idea. It's, it still works. But we said the top 25% of the market is what we're going to recognize. And that is going to have the leaders move the rest of the market and everyone will follow. They did follow in new construction, but they didn't in existing buildings. They stayed where they were. So we haven't, that, we can't keep thinking of leadership the same way. See, in this picture, there's a woman and a man. Is the woman running in a man's race or is the man running in a woman's race? It doesn't matter, but the point is, if it's either one, one of them is a leader. It's not about winning. What we have to do is change our thoughts about leadership only being about winning and being at the top. In fact, leadership can be you join wherever you are, you come in and you improve, that's leadership. You can be anywhere in the pack but you have to be in the game. We're about building. We're about creating tools to harvest. We're about building tools to help us harvest the same thing, to get that number down. So a year ago, at this stage, thanks to the generous sponsorship of Carrier, we were able to announce ARC, and um, we've been working really hard. So what I want to do is give you an update on what's happening and give you a sense of how it's working. I'm going to talk about the platform, projects, portfolios, which is our main strategy for getting started, and partnerships. The, the platform, as you all recall, is a very simple platform. It's a, it's a score, which is a mechanism of building reference sets of buildings coming in from all around the globe in order to create a single score to make sense, comparative sense, out of data coming from anywhere. So, uh, and we do it in five categories. We started with the categories based on lead because we believe that lead gives you a very good sense of how to think holistically about buildings. 
Very soon after we created the score for LEAD, we, we focused on disaggregating the scores because each individual score is a zero to 100 and it rolls up into the zero to 100 for LEAD. But we're disaggregating them now so you, we have a zero to 100 score in energy, water, waste, transportation, and et cetera. This is the first global energy score ever. It's the first global water score ever. It's the first global waste score ever. The first global transportation score ever and the first global human experience score ever. And we've built very powerful analytics to help you understand not just whether your, what your score is relative to each other, we give you the specific metrics that are associated with your building so you can determine what you can do with those. You can use those metrics. We'll give you the scope one and scope two emissions associated with your building so you can determine how to improve. These are ARC projects since December 1st, 2016. What I really like about this is that it gives you a sense of the global nature of the system which allows us to compare buildings around the world and see where best practice is. So we kind of know how that works, but what we're able to do now is actually see it. We can see it in the numbers, and I'm gonna show, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things we're learning there. Since we started, um, we have 800 million square feet in the platform. As John pointed out, we have, it's okay, it's 114 more than 2,000, 2,114 projects uh, in 66 countries, and we have 20 cities and communities. So projects, it's been a very exciting year in terms of projects. We have a lot of firsts, of course, because everything's new. Um, but we have our first airport in Delhi. We have our first building in Seattle. We have our first city in Washington, D.C. We have our first transit station in Delhi. We have our first skyscraper, our first stadium, our first hotel, our first convention center, our first state capital, our first hospital, our first university. And I'm only telling you these because I want to give you the sense of the beauty of the flexibility that performance allows. When you aren't establishing a set of rules, see, what we do very well with LEAD is we, we standardize the rules on the front end which help you know exactly what you need to do. Here, we're standardizing the outcomes on the back end. So we're tying you together based on how you're doing together, which is coming from the data that is in your building already. We have the first project in China. We have the first project in California. We have the first project in Puerto Rico. We have the first project in New York. And we have the first project in Boston. But what I really want you to notice about these is we aren't just saying what level of LEED certification, which is a powerful communicator. We're also giving you the metric tons equivalents of carbon. We're also telling you the gallons of water and the gallons per person and the gallons per square foot. We're telling you the amount of waste associated with each person and each square foot. So you can start to see, why am I doing so bad in this particular area and so good in this area and improve accordingly? We're saying transparency, showing what's really happening, revealing whether your high performance green building is a high performance green building is accountability, transparency and accountability improving constantly going from 40 down to 39.8 to 39.5, that's leadership. So what have we learned? Um, we've learned quite a bit. Uh, let me just give you a few lessons. This, this is one, this is the lead scorecard, one of my favorite tools. Um, one thing you'll notice, if any of you have ever worked on a project, you'll notice that people use the scorecard, a project, it organizes a project team, they work around the scorecard, and as they go, you, in new construction, you know, they, they go from design documents into construction, or design development into construction documents, and that, that's where things get dicey. All of a sudden, what everybody intended to do changes. But the scorecard keeps people disciplined and focused. And then what happens is, right as the construction documents are going to print, um, 
everyone's looking for that one extra point or that two extra points that gets you from silver to gold or from gold to platinum. Now, I think that's a fantastic thing. It, it actually means that the, this little tool is helping people do something more. But one of the criticisms we've heard for years is that that's point hunting. Lead is just about point hunting. It's not about integrative design or it's not about process. I think point hunting is fine, but I don't think we want to say that you do it once and it's all over. What we want to say is that you're part of a process that goes on for the life of the building. Now, what we're seeing in ARC is very different because the data, the score changes as data comes in. The score is going up and down based on what's happening in the building. It's based on a 12-month rolling average. But it's coming up, it, it's going up, usually goes up, up and down like two or three points, and it's kicking out 12-month-old data. That means that you have to remember to do a satisfaction survey again, or you have to go do a test for volatile organic compounds, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and as, as that changes, the score changes. What we're finding is that people are much more comfortable not being right at the edges of those thresholds. They don't, because the ARC score is connected to lead. 40 is certified, 50 is silver, 60 is gold, 80 is platinum. So it's a very, it's a very different way of thinking about where you want to be relative to those thresholds. That's one of the lessons. Another really interesting lesson is that we can have a system that recognizes local initiatives. So in ARC, we're taking data, let's just use carbon, we're taking data, your building is associated with your grid. So we're giving you primary energy information. Primary energy being, we're, we're showing the difference of your building in a, wherever it is. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't control the grid. How, why should I have, why should that be? But what we're about is making connections that improve quality of life. And we think that it's essential that we understand how buildings connect with grids as building become grids, as the grid becomes more disaggregated and buildings become more power generators. So in ARC, you're very highly rewarded in your score if you use renewable energy in a dirty grid instead of just using renewable energy in a very clean grid. It's just something we've learned, but it's very fascinating. And what we want to do is keep focusing that kind of change in those kind of places. As we looked globally, we found out something else that is really fascinating to me. Now, we've all known that, that the Nordics, um, the Nordic countries uh, manage their buildings incredibly well. But what we saw as soon as we, as soon as we got a whole bunch of projects from Sweden in the system is that an average building in Sweden performs better than the best buildings in the United States. How can that be? That's just, it, it threw us off because every building in Sweden was scoring perfectly in the energy section. So we had to go and adjust the score just simply to give them some good feedback. So what, what, what does that mean? It means that best practice, where we can look around the world for what's working the best is in the system and we can see it on the same platform. The, Sweden, the Swedes have, have said for years that they are going to have net zero grid and they're almost there. And, and the coolest thing when you go talk to them, I, I love going there because you talk to them and you say, well, why do you care about your score? You know, you're, you're building, you basically have zero carbon associated with your building. And they go, yeah, but we don't want to be like just allowing bad management of buildings because we have such clean energy. Plus, we can share that energy with Poland, which has a very dirty grid. So the, this is best practice. We can be doing that here. We can keep building that here in different parts of our own uh, country and different parts of the world. Another really interesting lesson is about our own scoring um, and access to resources. So we scored a whole bunch of cities in India, and we found out, of course, as, as we're thinking, because we, we basically took our, our scoring mechanism for buildings and we expanded it out to cities. We, we, we said, Buildings, campuses, neighborhoods, cities, 
and we used the same methodology. But what we found is that incredibly dense places that don't have access to energy and water scored outrageously well. Now, it makes sense because they aren't using so much energy and water at a per capita basis, but it's not what we want to be telling them. We, it's not the message we want to be sending, like, just don't give energy to anybody and don't let them have water, and then, you know, we'll all be fine as a world. What we want to be saying is, and WRI has been a great leader in this, what we want to be saying is, as you continue to give access of the, to these resources to people as you develop, you, we want to see your emissions stay the same or go down. Now we can track that, and it's very powerful to see it. One of our key um, strategies is borrowed from LEED, which was, don't boil the ocean. Don't try to do everything at once. Don't, it, we might want all buildings in, but don't pretend that we're gonna get them all in right away. It's just not gonna happen. So what we did was we said, let's build in the platform the ability for people to put their groups of buildings in, because we know there are a lot of people that have lead projects and non-lead projects. And let's get the non-lead projects in the same platform with the lead projects. And they can do lead if they want, but they don't have to do lead. And then they can see precisely how they compare to each other in the score. That has been very powerful. So what we built is essentially a, a set of features in the, in, in the software world, and these features um, allow you to see your entire portfolio. It's over there. They allow you to see your entire portfolio at once. Now, this is a school district. So, and this in this school district, there's not a single building is certified. But what you see, if you you can't you can't see the numbers, but what you see at the bottom is that the high schools, the bottom three buildings are high schools, and they are th scored at 37, 38, and 39. So if I'm the manager of this particular school district, I can look at this and go like, what the heck is going on at the high schools? Where, what do I need to focus on here? There's something happening. Is it fixtures? Is it the way the building's managed? Is it the way the people are using the resources? It allows me to focus from, uh, from uh, at a very high picture level and go in, start to make improvements and see what happens. We've also added a whole series of analytics in the portfolio section that allow you to set targets. So I can say, I wanna reduce my carbon emissions by 10% and I'm gonna start at this year and I can track those goals in each of the different categories based on what it is that I've set as my target. And this is very powerful, especially for people that maybe haven't set their own targets yet. I can also see all of my buildings and all of my scores in a single place. I can print this out and bring it into the boardroom and say, I need resources for this project. Look what's happening here. I can see um, my projects where they are in the world. I can see the best and the worst and the average in all of these different categories. And we're continuing to build advanced analytics that help you understand more and more of what you get when you're providing data uh, to us. The key thing is we can give you carbon per person, per square foot. We can give you water per person, per square foot. Almost every project that we talk to is blown away by the amount of water they use. And my favorite story, I won't tell you which project, but it's a project that received three platinum ratings, platinum in core and shell, platinum in existing buildings, and platinum uh, in uh, lead for new construction. And, uh, and, and it, it, it's amazing. They achieved every water credit that they had, and they were still using outrageous amounts of water. What was going on? They said, our score couldn't possibly be right. And they kept looking and looking, and it turned out they were doing a tremendous amount of landscape irrigation that they didn't know about. So they focused on that, reduced the landscape irrigation, and they're using a significantly amount of less, less water. 
the power of comparison is really strong. So let's look at these three school districts just to get a sense of, of what we can learn from this. And I really just want to focus on this, the school district two and school district three. The, the school district two is in the middle, it scores 63, and school district three is on the right. So they have the same, about exactly the same square footage, but school district three is using over twice as much energy as school district two. Why is that? But even more important, or more, more starkly different, is that school district three is using almost four times as much water as school district two. Now, it could be that they have a, they, it's cooling towers, it's, um, it's landscape irrigation. It could be that they care way too much about a lot of green grass in a desert climate. We don't know, but here we can see the power of, we can go to school district three and say, do you know that school district two has the same amount of square footage and they use less than half? That's, that's, that's a good sign to, hey, time to wake up. So as part of All In, we've gone to a number of portfolios and asked them to make commitments to put their non-lead buildings in with their lead buildings into the platform. And I'm very happy to say we have some companies and organizations that have stepped up. Boston Properties are putting all of their buildings in with a total square footage of 38 million. Vasa Kronen of Sweden, 178 building, 24 million square feet. I'm sorry for my international friends that I'm using footage instead of meters. Kilroy, 36 buildings, 6 million square feet. Vornado Realty Trust, 30 buildings, 28 million square feet. Parkway, 19 buildings, 88 million, 8.7 million square feet. Paramount Group, 18 buildings, 13.5 million square feet. Girding Eadland, 11 buildings, 2.5 million square feet. Commonwealth Partners, 10 buildings, 9.3 million square feet, which is a total of over 400 buildings and 130 million square feet in commitments that have been made in less than two weeks. <laughs> to me, the power of this shows our ability to get to a scale that helps us move the needle. The reason is because every place on the planet has portfolios. Every little government has a group of building. Every school district, every university, every landlord has a group of buildings. And we can get them in. Also, for those of you that have been using GRESB, um, just as another feature, I just simply want to show this because uh, many of the commercial real estate portfolios that uh, use GRESB have been asking us for this for a long time. You can now go into GRESB and fetch your portfolio information and put those assets, the individual buildings, in ARC so you can use our analytics or the score and connect it to LEED if, if you want. And you can also take, go from ARC and send data over to GRESB. So that's just something that the team has been working very hard on for a long time. For us, transparency, accountability, is your green building truly a high performance green building? Improving equals leadership. This is supposed to be black. It's funny because a lot of times I, I do this and then everyone's go, going like, oh man, what's going on? We'd better change the slide. Um, so last year, when we announced ARC, we also announced two pilot programs uh, that uh, ARC allows to be possible. One is lead for transit, and one is lead for cities. So ARC allows lead for transit because we were working with Delhi Metro and Shanghai Metro, and we couldn't use an Energy Star benchmark. So we, because now we have a significant data set, we could use our own benchmark, which then allowed us to to put all of the transit stations from Delhi Metro in and all of the transit stations from Shanghai Metro, which is very powerful because our next move is that we will go and start scoring transit lines. So they can compare the green line to the red line in a variety of different uh, uh, man ways. 
So uh, we just had the first two projects certified from Delhi uh, Metro Rail Corporation um, uh, in Delhi. Um, and in cities, we have uh, some very exciting news. Um, in Lead for Cities in the pilot, we now have the ability to impact in some way or another over 10.1 million people. We've been saying for years that we know we can't just do buildings. We can't just do buildings. We have to show how buildings fit, fit with cities. They're part of a bigger system. But you, we couldn't keep taking the rating system approach to a city. It just doesn't quite work. When we use data and, and allow ourselves to standardize the outcomes instead of standardizing the rule set, we can see a whole different thing that starts to happen. So now we're, start, we're starting to be able to see how buildings fit in cities. And we're starting to see how cities compare to each other. We have 3,000 square kilometers in the system. There are 45 cities in the pipeline. There are 20 that are registered. 11 of them are cities and nine of them are communities. Three of them are pre-certified. If you recall, what I announced last year in the Lead for Cities pilot was that instead of us giving you a rating system, we ask that you create a sustainability plan. And there are lots of great examples of sustainability plans out there. You create a sustainability plan, you agree to share data that we require about that plan, and you agree to make it transparent. You agree to get a score um, and a variety, of, uh, a variety of different things. If you agree to those things, you can pre-certify. So we have three cities that have pre-certified. And we have three cities now that have certified, which is very exciting. Washington, D.C. was the first city to certify just very recently. And the in interesting thing about this is, you know, of course, in the world we're in, the, the best places come forward first, right? So these places are going to score very highly. We're, we're going to see, but here's, here's the performance score of Washington, D.C. Their score is 84. Now, keep in mind, with buildings, we started with a data set of about 2,000 buildings, but we've massively ramped that up in the last two years. And what that does is it gives this very precise amount of accuracy to the score. With cities, we're just starting. So what we see right now is that the best cities are coming in, so they're all going to perform incredibly well. As we continue to get more cities in, the scores will start to fluctuate because they're being referred against the best and the worst in each type of city. Now, this is one of my favorite examples. Phoenix, Arizona came in, and the team here that's been working on cities, uh, we've got uh, Vatsal and Millie and Roger Platt and, and Gretchen, so many others. Um, there's so much work that's been done. I, I just, I, let's just take a moment and applaud these people. They've, they've been working really hard just talking to cities for a long time. <clears throat> but one of my favorite stories is Phoenix because what happened in Phoenix is they did a sustainability plan two years ago and then no one's heard anything about it. No one has, there haven't been reports, there haven't been anything. They wanted to be an ARC in order to help track whether or not what they've committed to is actually working. And um, so I commend Phoenix for joining the program. 517 square miles, 1.6 million people. Now what you see here when we're looking just at the outcomes is quite fascinating, right? Of course, they must have, a, they're, they're in a very sunny place. What this is telling us is they probably have a lot of solar um, because of being in that very sunny place, because they're performing very well in energy, and they're in a desert climate, and they use way too much water. And that's what we're seeing in this score as well. Arlington, Virginia just came in and uh, certified. And again, we're seeing something similar. I want to find out from Arlington what's going on with the water, because the water in Washington, D.C. was significantly different. It, it, I don't know what it is, but now we want to find out. And, and we have to check all the different pieces of the puzzle to see what's going on. The three cities that have pre-certified are Songdo in uh, Korea, uh, Savona, Italy, uh, Savona in Italy, Daniele, I don't know if you're here, but I know you worked on that, uh, Daniele Guglielmo, um, and Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport 
Now, Hartsfield is a really interesting story because they wanted to use the system because they, they wanted to see the impacts of the infrastructure reflected in what they do. So, so they're using the community system, but they're also using ARC for each of their buildings. So this will be a really interesting example of starting to see where the overall impact connects with the impact of the buildings. Okay, now partnerships. And this is a, this is a really uh, interesting area. Um, Mahesh Ramanujam, my friend and our new CEO, is in the back of the room. Welcome, Mahesh. <laughs> um, won't want to hear me say this. I, I, I think that we aren't a software company. I th Sorry, Mahesh. <laughs> I think we're a tools company and we use software uh, in order to help people connect their actions because software is so good at that. But we are surrounded by a lot of really good software companies and other groups that do really fascinating things. So what we're doing, what a technology allows us to do, I mean, just think of all the years we've been working on LEAD. One of my biggest frustrations, and I think we've all felt it, is what um, Adam Grant calls the narcissism of small differences. You know, us, us not being able to really connect well with all the other rating systems around the world. Now, I think we are, and Mahesh's vision is to actually consolidate all of the rating systems so life becomes easier. But it's been so challenging. What we can do with technology is integrate different ideas and platforms and thoughts in a very simple and elegant way. It, it allows for this massive amount of flexibility. So here we see some really interesting partners. Of course, Energy Star is a partner to everybody. Thank you, Energy Star, sincerely. Uh, 75F, and I, I know we have uh, Deepender Singh, who is the CEO of 75F. Deepender, would, would you mind just standing up? Um, 75F, please talk to Deepender about his system, because what, what they have is a really simple system that uses sensors, and uh, technology to do dynamic load balancing. So especially, let's take a school as an example. Um, it's really hot in one side of the school and really cold in the other side of the school. They have a system that at very low cost um, allows you to balance that out, but they also have this whole system of sensors that now then flows into ARC. So that data flows automatically, and you can get your lead score or your score that's connected to lead if you want it to be. Reset, um, do we have uh, uh, Rafer Wallace in the room? Rafer, yeah, would you mind just standing up? So you're also, this, so this is Rafer, Reset is his organization, is his uh, system. Reset is essentially, a, 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 it's a standard for indoor air quality. Is that a fair way to, fair way to say it, of indoor environmental quality? And that standard then uses uh, sensors that provides data, and now that data flows seamlessly into ARC. So um, that's an exciting partnership. We don't have to build that. JBill, I'm not gonna say much about JBill. Do, does anyone, do you know who JBill is? No one knows who JBill is, but it's publicly traded. They have 200,000 employees. Uh, they manufacture Tesla electronics. They manufacture Apple electronics. Um, and they've created this very exciting platform based on advanced GPS that we're integrating into the platform um, that will allow you to do many very interesting things. It'll allow you to create different parts of your building like a cooling tower or an asset or something and start to build it in a map of space. So we expect to launch that in, uh, sometime in March or April, but keep watching, it's gonna be very exciting. Uh, Gresb, uh, of course, you all know Gresb. We've been, Gresb has been part of the, um, uh, of the GBCI family for a long time. Who's here from Gresb? Ah, Senator Paul over there, please, uh, please talk to Senator Paul about Gresb because your portfolio should be in Gresb and you can get institutional investors. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I showed you that Grez, your, your Grez data can now flow into ARC and, and ARC back into Grez, a, a very simple way to expand our common universe. Energy profiles, is someone here from energy profiles? Um, 
Energy Profiles has a, uh, an energy management system. Again, it comes from, uh, you can use that system and it flows automatically into ARC so you can have that score and you can see it on the other side. Sierra, the same thing, it's an it's a energy management system. So the nice thing is, see the point is, we can be connecting these systems very simply in many, many different ways. One thing I'm really excited to announce, um, uh, and uh, there's been a lot of work happening on this, but Star Communities uh, has now become part of the GBCI family. Is anyone here from Star? Hillary, please stand up. Yeah, thank you, welcome Hillary. <laughs> I, please clap for Hillary because this, <laughs> the, this, this partnership is very exciting in terms of lead for cities because we've had lead for neighborhood development which doesn't exactly work in cities. But STAR was built for cities, so now we can integrate STAR into ARC and have a set of ideas that projects can use anywhere in the world. And our key, because STAR is mostly based in the US, one thing we'll be doing is working on how to make it more global. So talk to Hillary if you're interested in that, and thank you to Gretchen and everyone that's been working on this for so long. A friend of mine asked, a uh, friend that I see fairly often um, asked me, what do you want ARC to be? What, what's, what's this about? And um, I, I it, you know, because last year I stood up here and I sort of gave this talk about connections and actions and quality of life, and uh, it's hard to understand necessarily what those ideas mean. But what I want to have happen is that we keep seeing the whole system and we keep understanding how the whole system works instead of just our little piece of the system. So I want us to know, for example, I want people to know how grids impact their buildings. I want people to know how cities and buildings impact their health which we're learning from our esteemed colleagues at Harvard. I want people to understand how transit impacts their community and their space and their grid. I want them to understand how their site impacts their transit and their health. We simply want greater understanding so we can continue to connect the dots of how our entire system works and do something about it. We simply need to see that we're a network and that if we understand our place in the network, instead of only trying to deal with what we control, we can change all the pieces of it. What we'll be doing in the next year is focusing on these things. We're building a financial score because I want every sustainability director in every organization in the planet to be able to walk into a, the boardroom and say, look, our buildings in ARC that are scoring better are also performing better financially. These are a very good investment. Put more money in these bad performing buildings, let's get them up, let's improve our investment. So you'll see the financial score coming in and you'll be able to look at it right next to the performance score. Um, the, the sustainability performance score. We're working on a materials score because of course, if we leave materials out and only focus on the ongoing performance of buildings, uh, we won't be able to see the whole picture of carbon and water and waste and transportation and human experience. And that will allow us to build a whole building score. So not just, see, you can think of ARC as sort of starting with existing buildings, but where we wanna go is to include all buildings. And we've been thinking a lot about human experience. Of course, everyone's calling this different things right now, but it's a very, we know it's a very important thing. And as we heard from, from John, it's, it's, it's a driver, it's a key driver. People care a lot about how things impact them. So we're thinking a lot about that and, and we know that this is a very exciting time to be thinking about that area and we'll keep thinking about it and I'll let you know more as soon as we have more to talk about. 
And we're going to dramatically expand partnerships. We're going to keep expanding beyond what we're capable of building. We are all in. We are tool makers. We just make tools. We create scores to compare, to create transparency, accountability, so you can improve, and that is leadership. The stakes are high. Thank you.